But this morning we're going to be back in Romans chapter 4, so I invite you to join with me there in Romans chapter 4. As we've come through this chapter now, we've seen and we see all through Scripture that faith is foundational to the Christian faith, to, the Christian faith, to Christianity. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. There are some who struggle with faith altogether. Unbelief blinds them to see the glory of God that surrounds them. They struggle with believing that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But even you and I who claim faith in Christ can struggle in our faith. We believe that he is and that he rewards those who diligently seek him, but we question if this, if this God who is sovereign and powerful, will he intervene on my behalf? Will he heal or direct or provide the way that I expect him to or the way that I've asked him to? We question, well, what will he do even though I've prayed? Will he do anything? When our questioning heart is compared to the heroes of the faith, in the Bible, I don't know about you, but when my questioning heart is compared to those heroes of the faith, I feel intimidated, and sometimes I wonder, do I have faith at all in the struggles that I go through? We feel overwhelmed. This morning we're going to see, as Paul wraps up these thoughts in Romans chapter 4, he is using Abraham as the consummate example of faith from the Old Testament. We're going to see that, yes, Abraham had great faith, a strong faith, but was it a perfect faith? Perhaps as we look at this text this morning and compare it to others, maybe it'll be a strength to you and I as we grow in our faith. Look with me, if you will, Romans chapter 4. I'm going to begin in verse number 18. He says, in hope, he believed against hope. Speaking of Abraham here, picking up from last week's text. He believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him as righteousness, uh, but... Uh, but the words that was counted to him were not written for his own sake, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Amen. Bow with me in prayer, if you will. Father, thank you for your word this morning, your word and song that we've already sang and now, Lord, for your written word that we turn to, for you to speak to us through. And I pray that right now, Lord, you know our need, the need of each heart. You know the, the struggles of this past week. You know, Lord, the challenges, the battles that, that lie before us this week, of which we're not even aware. And you know exactly what we need in this hour. And I pray you would, you would deliver that to us through your word, by your spirit. And Lord, I do pray for that lost soul that may be here today without Christ, even now, Holy Spirit, work in that heart to draw them to yourself that they might be saved. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Last week, we looked at verses 13 through 17, and we saw Paul's focus on the relationship between faith and grace and the guarantee of justification. Fulfillment of the promise to Abraham as well as God's promises to you and I rests on grace, God's grace, so that it can be guaranteed. If it rested on our works, it could never be guaranteed, never. 
but it rests on grace and, and is guaranteed because it is through faith. God imputed righteousness to Abraham solely based upon his faith. Abraham was promised that he would become the, the father of many nations. And Paul in this context connects the promise of this many nations that Abraham would be the father of with those who share in the faith of Abraham, verses 16 and 17 of this chapter. Abraham's faith was in the God who, as Paul says, raises the dead and brings into being that which didn't exist previously. That is the God that he believed in, and we're going to see that's the God we must believe in as well. And so what is Paul saying here to us about the faith of Abraham and about uh, our faith as a growing faith? Well, the first thing I want us to notice in verse number 18, that a growing faith is a faith that hopes against hope, that hopes against hope. He says, in hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. The King James phrases it, who against hope, Believed in hope. And this is where that saying comes of, of believing in hope against hope. Uh, the New Living Translation captures what is really, or what, you know, the essence of what's being said here. It translates it this way even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham hoped. He kept hoping. Abraham was told, Your very own son will be your heir. Genesis chapter 15. And, he's, and God said, the, the, the number of your descendants will be like the stars in the sky. If you can count them, that's what your offspring is going to be like. In Genesis 15, God was assuring uh, Abram of the promise he'd already made back in Genesis chapter 12. Back in Genesis 12, Abram was 75 years old and Sarah was 65 when God told him he would make of him a great nation. In Genesis 13, God reiterated that to Abram, and he used another analogy there. He says, your descendants are going to be like the dust of the earth, if you can count the dust of the earth. Imagine that. Abram and Sarah now have lived 10 more years beyond that. And now they've gone down to Egypt. You know the story there. They returned to Canaan. They have parted ways with Lot. They have rescued Lot from being a prisoner of war, so to speak, and then uh, blessed by Melchizedek. All of this took place in this 10 years. Now Abram is 85 and Sarah is 75 years old. Even in the life expectancy of Abraham and Sarah in that day, they were getting beyond the years of childbirth. Their bodies are getting old. Questions to begin to arise. Is there any hope of this promise? Well, how is God going to fulfill this promise? Well, Abram reasons in his mind 10 years later. Uh, you know, a lot of sand has gone through the sandals. <laughs> I, I must have misunderstood what God said. I, I have a good faithful servant in Eliezer. Maybe God's just going to bless me through a Eliezer. And that's when God shows up and says, No, it's not through Eliezer that your descendants will come. It'll be from your son that will come from you. And it's not even going to be in Genesis 16 when Abram and Sarah took it in their own hands and said, let's help God out here. And Ishmael is born of, of, of the Egyptian servant Hagar. And God says, no, it's not going to be Eliezer and it's not going to be Ishmael. But interestingly enough, God has them wait another 14 years. Abram is 99 years old. Sarah is, seven, uh, is 89 at this point. I've got to do math quick in my head there. Sorry, getting my tongue tied. And that's when God comes to Abram and says, a year from now, when you're 100 years old, a year from now, you're going to have a son. You're going to have a son. Now, if you go back and you read it in Genesis chapter 17, when God tells Abram that, Abram laughed. Everybody focuses on Sarah. She laughed in Genesis 18. But in Genesis 17, Abram laughed. This is hilarious. A hundred-year-old man having a child. This is hilarious. That is his response. So did Sarah. 
hope seemed to be gone, humanly speaking, right? Romans fourteen, uh, Romans 4 here, verse number 19, says that Abram's body was as good as dead and Sarah's womb was barren. The ESV says it's the same word. Her womb was dead. That's what it says. How can this be? And yet scripture says, yet he still hoped in the promise of God. He was still believing the promise. In other words, there was no human, feasible, logical, natural explanation in which he could hope. But once God came to him, and even though he laughed after that, God says, no, it's really going to be real. He believed God, continued to believe God. So he was hoping when there was no human reason to hope. As we read scripture over and over again, our faith, the faith of the believer, is connected with hope. We have hope because we have faith in God. And by the way, hope is not the wishful thinking, all right? Like, I hope we have a white Christmas this year, or I hope that this happens. You know, and, you know it's not that wishful thinking. It is an assurance of God's fulfilled promise. Amen. That's the hope. He said he's coming. I believe he's coming. That kind of hope, all right? And so I trust him. And so our, our faith generates hope. It is the faith that the, in the promises of God that give us the hope, the assurance that when it appears that all hope is gone, he is still going to fulfill his promises Amen. to us. In the uh, JYC club that we do on Tuesdays in the local school, I'm telling them the story last week and this week of a missionary named uh, Darlene Deibler or Diebler and uh, and I, I commend you, you, you need to look up her testimony on YouTube. She died in 2004. There's an audio of her testimony, and there's some video uh, as well that's loaded there. But Darlene and her husband, Russell, went to the mission field in, in uh, Papua New Guinea in the, late in the late 1930s. And they were ministering to a tribe there, but in, but in 1940. 41, I, I can't get all the dates ready, but World War II broke out and the Japanese invaded the islands of that area. And they invaded Papua New Guinea and they arrested this missionary couple and they separated them, took her husband to a, a Japanese internment camp for men and they took her, she ended up in another internment camp for women and her husband died in the internment camp there and, and, and the, to hear the atrocities, to read and hear her speak of the atrocities that she went through and she kept praying to God, God deliver me and I can't believe you're taking this away from me and the word of God just kept coming back to her over and over again giving her assurances of his grace and of his strength. And let me tell you, and it is in those times, times like that that we forget about in this blessed age in which we live. But to hear of how God sustained her and brought her through and used her to minister to those that she was, uh, she was arrested with. Uh, listen, and, and then even to her captors as well, to be a testimony to them. But I, I, I commend that to you, and I encourage you to listen to that. But faith, just like faith gave Abraham hope when all air re reason for hope had failed, that is the faith that you and I need. Number two, we see in verses 19 and 20, we need this faith, a growing faith that will not weaken, that will not weaken. In verses 19 and 20, Paul says that Abraham's faith did not weaken, nor did it waver. This is contrasted in verse 21 with strong faith. He had strong faith, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But what we see here in this contrast between weak and wavering faith and a strong faith is the vulnerability of faith, of belief. Abraham's faith could have been weakened by two things. Notice what Paul points out here. Number one, his faith could have been uh, weakened by his understanding of the natural world or of man's perspective. Verse 19, he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body that was as good as dead and Sarah's dead womb. 
Abraham is 100, Sarah is 90. With regard to conceiving children, humanly speaking, they were as good as dead. That is what the text is saying here. These are natural, real-world facts that conflicted with the promise of God. Are you with me, church? God gave to Abraham a promise. And the promise that God gave to Abraham at this point looked impossible because of human, real-world facts that we deal with every day. Natural law. Does God typically work within the framework of his natural law? Well, yes, he does. Most of the time. In fact, I can tell you, you know, every one of us in this room, barring the return of Jesus Christ, we're going to face death. All right? That's a natural fact that we've all got to wrestle with and come to grips with. We're all headed from the cradle to the grave. That's where we're headed. I hate to, you know, I like to encourage you a little bit this morning. So just encouraging you, all right? Lifting you up. It's a great day. Yeah. But, but that's what, I mean, these are facts. It's a fact. The sun comes up. The sun goes down. God, God has put natural law into, into work. And, and, and yes, young people have babies. Old people spoil them. I mean, that's what we do, all right? And, and so that's the, the natural law. So here, yes, God normally works within natural law because he created natural law. But this God who created natural law can also suspend natural law if it fits into his eternal plan and brings glory to his name. Think of the story that I read at the opening of of the service this morning out of Matthew chapter 14. In the early morning hours, here are the disciples in the boat battling against the wind and the waves, and here comes Jesus walking on the water. Now you say, Brother Larry, you really believe Jesus was walking on the water? Yes, I believe Jesus was walking on the water. Disciples see him, and they are scared to death. They've never seen this. I mean, it's not every day, right? You see this. But uh, it's been a few years since I've seen anybody walk on water. And uh, you don't see this every day. They're scared. They think it's a ghost, and Jesus reassures them, don't be afraid, it's, it's me. It's really me. And that's when Peter He's, standing, he's in the boat. And we, we, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but he says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you. And Jesus said, come. Now, people say, well, uh, Peter stepped out of the boat onto the water. No, he stepped out of the boat onto the word of Christ. Amen. That's what he did. And Jesus suspended, he had suspended the natural law. People don't normally walk on water. Jesus is walking on the water. He suspends natural law. Peter is now walking on the water towards Christ. The implication from the text is he gets near to Jesus and at that point he takes his eyes off of Christ and he looks at the natural world. Jesus said, come here. Peter is walking on his word, the promise of his word, and yet then Peter sees the waves and the wind and begins to doubt. And of course he sinks. But then Jesus rescued him, grabs him by the arm, lifts him up. But notice what he said. He said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? You see, that's where the the little the, the the weakness of faith came because Peter's eyes got off of Christ and on the natural world. And so we've got to you know and so anyway this is where Abraham and Sarah if they were looking at the natural world the natural world said this ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. God made a promise he can't fulfill. But just as doubt and fear came when Peter's heart began to believe in his senses and he, uh, he sank into the water, Paul says that Abraham did not allow his rationale to overcome him, to weaken his faith. The second thing that weakens our faith is distrust of the promise in verse 20. God had given Abraham a promise. Verse 20 says, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. 
Now this is important because Paul emphasizes this four times in this chapter, making a connection. Now get this, he, Paul makes the connection between God's promise to Abraham and his fulfilling that promise and God's promise to you and I and fulfilling that promise in salvation, Amen. in justification. And so this, this connection is vital because Paul is basing his argument on the full, he's basing the argument of fulfilled promises regarding our justification is based upon the fulfilled promise to Abraham. And if you start explaining away the promise to Abraham and saying, well, God changed his mind and God reneged on his promise to Abraham, then what's to say he won't renege on his promise to you and I? But Paul would say, no, look, he fulfilled these promises. He's going to fulfill this Amen. promise. That is why it is so important. But in, the, in regard to the promise, he says that in verse number 20, no unbelief made him waver. The word waver there, or to, be, to sh- be shaken, is, to, is, is the word that means to, to be conflicted within. It reflects this battle within of, do I do this or not do this? Is this true or not true? And it became to be known as doubt, and is translated as doubt. Uh, it's, and this doubt brings about no faith. Notice he says no unbelief. The word there is unbelief, is no faith. That's literally the word. There's no faith. No lack of faith made him doubt concerning the promises of God. You see, doubt will lead to no faith, to unbelief. James rebukes the doubting as being tossed about like a wave of the sea. And we struggle with our doubts and are overcome with our doubts at time. And that's why I'm so thankful that Jude tells us to show mercy to those that are doubting to have mercy upon them and help those that are tossed about by the waves of the sea. But doubt will weaken our faith. Abraham's faith was not weakened. It was was strong. That's what we're about to see in the latter part of verse 20. It was not weakened by the natural world and it was not weakened by doubt. But his faith was a faith, verse 20, that was strong and that glorified God. At the end of verse 20, he says, But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Contrasted with a staggering faith or a weak faith, or as Jesus said to the disciples, little, having little faith, Abraham's faith grew strong. That's how the ESV translates this. Other translations say it was strong or that it was strengthened. It is in the passive voice, and that implies that Abraham's faith was being grown to be stronger than it was. In other words, it's a process of growth, and that's why the ESV translates it this way. His faith was gradually being made more powerful. That's the implication of this verse and of the story of Abraham. A strong faith, a growing faith, realizes that faith is nothing to glory in. You got that? Faith is nothing to glory in. Faith's potential is realized only in the almighty, sovereign, holy, just, powerful, promise-keeping God who is to be the object of that faith. You got that? If we're boasting in our faith, then we've got a problem. Whether that has to do with salvation or whether that has to do with our sanctification, the, the strength of faith is only in the object of that faith. God is the one in whom Abraham trusted. Abraham's faith is meaningless unless God is able and trustworthy to fulfill his promise. Paul has already stated that there's no boasting in faith earlier in this chapter. Boasting is excluded by the law of faith. Faith points us to the object of faith. So Abraham's faith glorified God because it continually pointed to God 
and the promise he made and his ability, Paul uses the word power here, to fulfill that promise, to fulfill that promise. He was fully convinced, if you look at verse 21, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. He was fully persuaded, the word used here is to, to, to carry something that is completely full. It is an intensified uh, version of the word fulfill. I mean, it, it's like how can you fill it full and then fill it fuller? I mean, it's hard to do that, but that's the intensification here. He was fully convinced that God was able, powerful enough to do what he had promised. He was fully convinced to be fully persuaded, to be assured. These are words that could be translated here. When God took Abraham aside and said to him, Eliezer is not going to be your heir, and Ishmael is not going to be your heir, your own son that comes from your own body will be your offspring, and, they, and the offspring th- from him and throughout the generations will not be able to be counted like the dust of the earth and like the stars in the sky. Amen. When God told Abraham that, the scripture says that, that Abram said, Amen. Amen. Literally in the Hebrew, Yahweh is able. It is true. It is true. He was fully convinced that God was powerful enough and sovereign enough to do what he had promised to do. Amen. That is why Paul says that faith was counted to him as righteousness in verse number 22. But at this point, I'd like to do one of my but wait. Can I do that? If Abraham's faith was so strong and it wasn't weakened and he was fully convinced and there was no wavering and there was no doubt, if that's what it takes, then I'm up the creek without a paddle. We all are. Yeah, we are, John. But I'd like to, let's go back and pause a minute and say, well, what is Paul talking about here? Because if we go back to the Genesis account in Genesis chapter 15, The reason God gave Abram the assurance of Genesis 15 is because Abram said to God, are you sure about this? I'm getting older and still don't have a a child. And my my servant Eliezer must be, that's what he said, my servant Eliezer, he must be the heir. You know, I mean, that was God's response to him. In Genesis 16, immediately after that God assured Abram of the promise, in Genesis 15, Genesis 16 is when he and Sarah concocted this plan to help God out. I mean, God obviously needs a little help, right? And so they concocted the plan, this pagan practice with the the Egyptian servant Hagar, and Ishmael is born. And then in Genesis chapter 17, when God said that Sarah was going to have a baby, Abraham Abraham laughs. And then Sarah laughs. But but Paul's talking about he didn't waver in his faith and he he was fully convinced. And yet you go back to Genesis and you think, well, I, I don't know if that's what that sounds like. Genesis 15, 16, and 17 sounds more like my struggle with faith. All right. Rather than what Paul's describing here. Well, this is what I'd like for us to consider this morning. Faith that is growing strong, and that's what Paul implies here from the text. Faith that is growing strong is not yet perfect faith. And I'm going to quote John MacArthur here because I, I thought this was, I'm not quoting the entire uh, paragraph, but I'm going to give you some excerpts from it. He puts it this way as he talks about this, and I'm glad some com- some commentators don't even address this. And I'm like, man, is there nobody else there like me? You know, struggling sometimes with my faith. And and I was glad that MacArthur talked about this a little bit. He says this, and I quote: "Struggling faith is not doubt. The fact that Abraham was trying to understand how God's promise could be fulfilled indicates he was looking for a way." of fulfillment. Sincere struggling with spiritual problems comes from a strong, godly faith. 
Now get this, this is what I love to underline this. Godly faith is not, is not full understanding, but full trust. Godly faith is not full understanding, but full trust. Abraham's faith was not perfect. You read about his life. Sometimes it was three steps forward and two steps back. Sometimes it was three steps forward and four steps back. But eventually there was growth. Are you kidding? That's a big word here. There was growth in his faith. And his, his not doubting was he never doubted that God was able. He didn't know how God was going to do it. He questioned how God was going to do it. But yet godly trust, godly faith is not full understanding but full trust. Similarly, sometimes you and I question how God will, will accomplish his promises. And when we pray to him, is he going to fulfill that prayer like we want him to? Not always. But we're always, we can always trust that he is powerful enough to do what we've asked him to do. Amen. If it is according to his will. And if it brings glory to his name. But this faith that is growing, this faith that is growing stronger is not just talking about the past, about Abraham's faith. Notice what he says here in verses 23 through 25. These words were not just for him. This is the faith that we're talking about in Abraham, but it's a faith that saves us now Amen. in our lives right now. This is going to conclude Paul's use of Abraham as this great example of faith. What Abraham did and what happened in Abraham's faith was not just for him. It says the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. Yes, God had a great plan of redemption that involved this promise to Abraham and to his descendants. And through Abraham and his descendants, the Messiah, God the Son, would come and he would go to Calvary's cross and he would die for our sins and he would rise again. What a wonderful plan that God had to bring the, the saving Messiah into this world. Amen. All through Abraham, yeah. yes. So the promise God gave to Abraham, yes, was for Abraham's sake and for his offspring. But it was for you and I as well. Abraham believed, now get this, this is what I'm trying to tie this in with the previous context. Abraham believed in the God who could raise the dead and bring into being that which did wasn't existing before. You remember that statement? That's the God he trusted. Abraham, did he believe that God could raise the dead? Oh yeah, Hebrews tells us. When he offered Isaac in obedience to God, what does Hebrews tell us? He believed that God could raise him from the dead. Now that's faith. A man that had never seen a resurrection. We've actually heard about resurrections. We've heard about the resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus raised people from the dead, and then Jesus himself was raised from the dead. In Abraham's day, that was, that was, that was unheard of. And yet he believed so much by that point in Genesis 22 that God said, your, your prodigy is coming through this boy, and now you're telling me to offer this boy as a sacrifice? Then that means you're going to raise him from the dead. He believed in a God who could raise him from the dead. And he could bring into being that which wasn't existing before. He's the one that knew that his body was dead and his wife's body was dead as far as childbearing was concerned. And yet God spoke it into existence and brought this life, the life of Isaac into existence. This is the crux of saving faith, redeeming faith justifying faith it, it's rooted in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that's what he that's what Paul ties it in with Jesus had to come Jesus had to come and take on human flesh and completely obey the father because Adam did not and we cannot 
So Jesus lived a righteous life, fulfilling the, the will of the Father, but then went to Calvary's cross and suffered and bled and suffered under the wrath of God for our sins and gave his life a ransom for us. Amen. His life was, was, he freely laid down his life, Jesus said. But then three days later, yeah. out of that tomb, up from the grave he arose Amen. with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He was delivered up, Paul says, for our trespasses. This is a legal term. The guilty criminal is handed over for the punishment that he deserves. That's the typical word. But here, Jesus, not deserving uh, punishment on his own, but bearing our sins, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah says, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was delivered up, committed to this punishment for our trespasses, not for his own. Just as Paul says again in Romans 5, that, uh, that the Lord commands, the Lord proves his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us in our place. He was delivered up for our trespasses, and he, and in him who, uh, who was delivered up for our trespasses, verse 25, and raised for our justification. You see, the raising of Christ was the statement of the Father that propitiation had been made. If you've been with us, we've been talking about this word propitiation and redemption, and you ought to know those as a, as a Christian. You need to know those. But the, the, the righteousness of the Father, the wrath of the Father was appeased through the sacrifice of his Son. Amen. And, and, and because that sacrifice was sufficient, guess what? Jesus, three days later, raised from the dead. Amen. Death could not hold its prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Jesus had no sin. He died freely for our sins, but he had no sins of his own. Death had no claim to him at all. And he tore the bars away and came out of that grave, that tomb. And it's only because that that proved, and by the way, uh, this is the second reason that Paul gives for Christ's resurrection or the reason uh, that, that flows from it. He told us in, in chapter 1, verse 4, that when Jesus rose from the dead, he was declared to be the Son of God with power. You remember that? Yeah, yeah. He is really God the Son, come in the flesh. And now death could not hold him. He is risen. He is the Lord of lords and Amen. King of kings. Amen. And here Paul says, not only that, but he was raised saying that now we can be justified by his righteousness, because his righteousness uh, uh, was, more, was so powerful that the grave could not hold him. The grave had no claim upon him. He was raised for our justification. Death could not keep his prey. Keep going back to that song. Maybe we should have sang it this morning. I should have said something, Mike, but... Uh, but he was raised from the, from the dead, declared to be the Son of God, raised as providing the propitiation for our sins to the Father. His, his sacrifice was received and accepted. And because he lives, we are going to sing that song a little bit later, because he lives, you and I, through faith in him, can now be declared righteous before the thrice holy God. This is, but this is what Paul's been leading us to all through here. Because he lives, now we can look to the Father. And the Father looks at us, and through faith, he sees the righteousness of his Son. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We are justified, declared righteous by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Amen. Faith is critical to salvation, to our justification before the thrice holy God. 
critical to our relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul puts forth Abraham as this great example, which he is, of being a person of faith. Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him, counted to him as righteousness. Similarly, our righteousness is through faith in Christ in the same way. What he, we, we believe him. We believe his word. We agree with him. What he says about our lost condition, that we are sinners before a holy God, that salvation is through Jesus and Jesus alone, his person as God the Son come in the flesh, his righteousness that, that he lived out in fully obeying the Father, his death in our place on Calvary's cross, his resurrection. That is why we do not work for our salvation, but simply, as Paul says, believe in him who justifies the ungodly. That is when our faith is counted to us as righteousness, just as Abraham's faith was counted to him. We are not to have a weak faith. We should have a growing faith. We shouldn't have a faith that focuses on our reason our feelings, our, per, our perceptions. Our faith is in him who makes the promises and fulfills those promises Amen. even, now get this, even when those promises go against the world that we see around us. Right. Even when those promises go against our rationale. Even when those promises go against our feelings. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths or make your paths straight. Amen. You and I are to have a growing faith, an unwavering faith. Now get this, fully convinced in our minds and heart that God is powerful enough to do what he says he will do. Amen. This doesn't mean we won't question. We may question how he will accomplish his word. Like Abraham and Sarah, we may stumble through some fleshly efforts to help God out. Well, there's consequences for that as we see with Abraham and Sarah as well. But ultimately, we come to rest, to settle our minds on the fact that God is God and he will keep his promises. He will keep his promises. As MacArthur said, godly faith is not full understanding, but full trust. Fully trust him. Faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence, the conviction, the evidence that demands a verdict for the things that are not seen. That's what the scripture tells us. This morning, as we think about all this, you know, the greatest promise that we find to us as, as, as people on this earth is the fact that the promise we'll read later is, is in Romans chapter 10. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We are not hopeless. We are not hopelessly condemned. We are not hopelessly lost. If you're here today and, and you don't know Christ, there is hope. Remember that word? There is hope. There is the promise of hope through faith in him. And if you don't know Christ today, then I pray that, that God the Holy Spirit is working already to open your heart to his truth, that you will see your need of a Savior, that you are a sinner standing before a holy God. And you are, as the word of God says now, you are right now condemned. It's not that you will be condemned. You are right now condemned because you have not believed on the name of the Son of God. But the good news is that Jesus came. He lived the righteous life that we can't live and went to Calvary's cross and died in our place and rose again the third day. And if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus as your Savior, believing that, yes, he died and died for you and rose again the third day, you can be saved. He can change you and will change you for all of eternity. And I pray that right now, where you're seated even, or at this altar, or maybe in talking to someone after the service today, 
that you will bow your heart and your life before the Lord of Lords and King of Kings and surrender your heart to him. And you can enter into eternal life, this eternal relationship with him right now. Bow with me in prayer, if you will. Father, we thank you for this powerful passage we've been going through now for the last several weeks. And Lord, we're just through chapter four. There's so much more that lies before us. And Lord, there's so much we've left out that we haven't had time to discuss. But Lord, I pray that as we look at these truths that you are making a difference in our lives. And Lord, I pray that our faith is growing just like Abraham's faith. I admit my faith is not perfect and I, there are days that I go through with doubt and struggles. And I pray and I, I, I believe who you are and I believe that you exist and you reward those that diligently seek you. But yes, like Abraham, sometimes we struggle. And how is God gonna fulfill his promise this time? But Lord, I pray that you would grow our faith to know that no matter the circumstances of this life, no matter if even the circumstances of this life tell us that, that you're not coming through, that Lord, you are coming through for us on behalf of your people. And Lord, as we, per, as we, uh, as we uh, persevere through the struggles and the heartaches of this world, that you have, you have promised to be with us, to never leave us, never forsake us. You will provide our needs. You will guide us. You are, you are completing in us the work that you've already begun. All of these promises, Lord, that we begin to doubt and we begin to struggle with, Lord, grow our faith. Make us stronger in our faith in you. And Lord, I pray for that soul that's here today that doesn't know you. Lord, I pray that even now, Holy Spirit of God, do a work as you strengthen your people, now convict the hearts of the lost. May they see their need of you, and may they simply look to you in faith, cease their work, and simply believe in the God who declares lost sinners to be righteous because of Christ. Lord, we pray all of this for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Stand with us, if you will. Brother Mike's going to come and lead us in a song of response. And I just encourage you today to listen to the Lord and obey him. And if you need someone to pray with you, we're here available to pray with you today. He is able. 